The teachings of General Conference are the considerations the Lord would have before us now and in the months ahead. Our marching orders for each six months are found in the General Conference addresses. For the next six months, your conference edition of the Ensign should stand next to your standard works and be referred to frequently. I encourage you to read the talks once again and to ponder the messages contained therein. I exhort you to study the messages of this conference frequently, even repeatedly, during the next six months. You're listening to the Conference Talk Podcast, where it's conference weekend every weekend. Every week on this show, we discuss talks from the most recent general conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We'll share some insights, make some connections, and hopefully have a bit of fun as we study the words of the men and women God has called to direct His church in these, the latter days. This is episode number seven. I'm Chanel Nielsen, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Andrea Hales. Hello! Hi. We will be talking today about Elder Oak's talk, The Need for a Church. And this was a fantastic talk. I He started it off with an experience, a story of a, a man named Kenneth and his wife, Lucille. And this was something that Elder Marky Peterson had shared many years before. I think it was in the 70s. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so he talked about how they basically felt like their life was good and they didn't really need to go to church. And um, I I looked back and I read that talk and the whole talk was geared toward written to Kenneth and Lucille about why they kind of needed to change their life. It was really interesting. Yeah, it was. I read it too. I didn't read the other talk that this, this talk references, but I read that and I was like, oh man, I can see so many people in this talk, not just the Kenneth and his family that it's referring to. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? And I think that even more nowadays, like, you know, Elder Oaks talks about this, that people are moving away from wanting to go to church and feeling like they need church. I I feel like I hear all the time, I can be spiritual without church. And so, you know, Kenneth and Lucille had their situation, but even more nowadays, it almost is not even a discussion. It's just like, why would I go? Why is this even an issue for me um, in the world? I feel like that, that people uh, just don't really even think about that. That's just not what you do on Sunday. Yeah. 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 We, we, um, I live in Utah, so I'm surrounded by a lot of neighbors who do go to church with me, but one of our favorite neighbors doesn't go to church. And we, we just love the heck out of her anyway, but, but she she doesn't want to. She just is like, no, I'm, I'm not at that point in my life. And she's an older lady, (laughs) but (laughs) we're like, okay. And it's her decision. It truly is. But this, this talk that Elder Oaks gave is so, I, it just gives so many reasons why anybody should go to church, whichever denomination you are. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting. He says early on in the talk that Attendance in all churches is down, and he says his concern is not just for members of our church to go to church. It's not just like, let's get the attendance Mm -hmm. up in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Basically, what I get from this talk is the world is a better place when more of us go to church. And the fact that a lot of us are not participating in church and that people don't think it's important. I'm going to read this quote because it's really interesting. Significant numbers separating themselves from God reduce his blessings to our nations. And that's so interesting, right? Like we know that religious freedom is important. We know that it's important for people to be able to choose what they do. But I thought that this was really interesting that when people don't choose God in whatever form, then our nation suffer. I actually am studying the Constitution and the founding of the United States, just a little bit like a brief overview, but I am studying it, whereas I haven't really done that before. And this nation, the nation of the United States of America was founded on religious people on their beliefs that there is a God that we had somewhere we we came from before we came to this earth, that we're going somewhere else after we leave this earth, and all the things that we believe as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they also believe that this should be taught not just in our homes, but at church. People should attend church. That's so interesting. What an interesting study. I love that you're doing that. 
So I, I really appreciated that he was like, it doesn't matter which, which way you worship, please worship and worship together. Yes. And that kind of goes into the next part of this talk, right? The importance of meeting together and all the benefits and all the things that come from that. You know, when we go to church every Sunday, it's easy to, or most Sundays, whatever the case may be, it's easy to kind of overlook all of the things that we're gaining. As I was reading over this talk, I'm in a few LDS moms groups on Facebook. And one of the things that people will say a lot, and it comes in different forms, but one of the posts that people write will say, I went to church and nobody talked to me. It's so hard to go to church with my little ones. What's the point of even going? Or, you know, I'm not getting anything out of church. I think I would do better if I just stayed home. And it's so interesting. It's easy to justify that to ourselves and Elder Oaks's whole talk is a response to those kind of concerns. I definitely agree. I have another neighbor in my life who doesn't go to church for different reasons than this. Not because she wouldn't like to, but she just suffers with so much anxiety being around a large group of people. And I can see that that one is different than just being like, well, I don't fit in. I don't, nobody even cares that I'm there. And I think we're all a little bit guilty of that too, that we don't turn around and shake everybody's hand. But some of us just go and we want to just sit there for a minute and not have to turn around and shake everybody's hand too. (laughs) Yeah. Isn't that interesting? It's kind of a, a fine line because you know, sometimes you just want to just go to church and sometimes you're dealing with your own heavy burdens, right? And so we have to just do the best we can, whatever that looks like. And you bring up a good point. Sometimes that does mean not going to church if you've got health issues, whether that's physical or mental health, and you can't actually make it to church, you do the best that you can and and you're still a part of the church. Um, in whatever way that looks like. President Oaks says, personal disappointment should never keep us from the doctrine of Christ who taught us to serve, not to be served. So that speaks to this point of, um, oh, I don't, things aren't going good. I don't have friends. I don't like it. Um, You know, that's not the point. And so when we get caught up in that, it's a good time to take a good hard look. And I know people who, have been there for a long time where they don't feel connected with their ward, where, you know, they don't feel that they're a part of it or they have friends, but they keep going. And yeah. that can be hard and that can be painful. But ultimately, I think that's what we're being called on to do, regardless of the amount of friends that we have in our ward. He also said that we go to serve, not to be served. Yeah. That one's pretty like succinct in the direction from an apostle. We go to serve, not to be served. Yeah. And he also quotes President Spencer W. Kimball, and this is in that same line, but this one just, I don't know, those olden days, I mean, he's not too, too far back, but far back enough that these guys were just like, said it how it was. President Spencer W. Kimball, right? He said, we do not go to Sabbath meetings to be entertained or even solely to be instructed. We go to worship the Lord. It is an individual responsibility. If the service is a failure to you, you have failed. That part, like, yeah. yikes, you know, I feel like nowadays we're so we're so soft in our language. We don't come out and say, hey, if you didn't like that talk, it's your fault. You know, we don't. Um, But when you really think about that, and he goes on to say, no one can worship for you. You must do your own waiting upon the Lord. And I think for me, my first instinct as I read this is just like, ouch, what? You know, you don't want to hear that. That's not nice and friendly. And yet, in all reality, we go to church to serve. We go to church to worship. We are responsible for those things at the end of the day. And when we change that responsibility and we say, okay, is someone going to shake my hand? Is the speaker going to give a talk that I like or that's entertaining to me? We're missing the mark. And we need to go even with the most boring speaker. There's another President Kimball quote. 
I don't know exactly how it goes, but I remember someone said, what do you do when you're in a boring meeting? And he thought, and he said, I've never been in a boring meeting. He took what he was <laughs> counseling here very seriously. He wasn't sitting around waiting to be entertained. So even when you're with the most boring speaker, it's your job to get something from it. Yeah. And I have fallen prey to that as well. Like less so with a boring speaker and more so with like in Sunday school or Relief Society when somebody starts talking and I'm like, you're missing the mark on the question that was asked. Your comments are off mark. And I'm like, okay, redirect mm. my thoughts because they're, they were trying to participate and they were trying, they were trying to worship. Yeah and share their worshipful thoughts with us, I need to redirect my thoughts. I don't know if you've ever been in that kind of a situation before. Yes, more than I'd care to admit. It's true. It, all throughout church. And that's so interesting. It's a really good point you bring up because all throughout church, we have the opportunity to redirect. Are we judging the speaker or are we listening to the spirit? Are we getting irritated that sister so-and-so is crying again? Or are we like, you know, trying to feel what she's feeling? And yeah, it's a constant way to check in with ourselves and to see if we are doing what we need to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so back to the talk, he talks about uh, church directed service helps us to overcome the personal personal selfishness that can retard our spiritual growth. So that's again what we were talking about before is church service. When we go, we go to serve, not to be served. And if we allow that, then we we aren't retarded in our spiritual growth. We're growing in our spiritual growth. So I think that's really good. Yeah. No, that is. And he talks about somewhere how without the church to push us along to, oh, it's to provide the motivation and structure for unselfish service, we wouldn't do it. And I thought that was really interesting too in that, in that same vein yeah. that, you know, we, we need the push. Yeah. We're slowed down otherwise if we don't have that motivation, whatever that may be. If it's a sign up sheet going around, you know, we have good intentions, but the church puts us pushes us into action. So most of the stuff that we've talked about so far has all been directed to anybody who should go to church, which would be all of us. And then he changes his his talk and he directs it directly to members of our church. Yeah. And he talks about all the blessings because we know there are specific blessings um, for attending and being part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Because of the restored gospel, because of priesthood ordinances, there are things, there are ordinances that we need, including every Sunday to go and partake of the sacrament and to you know, worship together in that way that we can only get. And he points out some other other things that we can only get through meeting as a church. Were there some that stood out to you, Andrea? Well, actually, I kind of had a question about some of those, and I wanted to get your opinion, because some of the things I understand that that is one of the reasons why you go to church, but why why are you saying this is pretty much only found at church? Like, well, he talked about spiritual growth, and I'm like, well, according to the world, you can get spiritual growth by yourself. So does that really have to be at the church? And he talked about service, and I'm like, well, you can serve outside of the church. Does that really have to be at church, at our our denomination? He talked about um, how church helps us learn love and compassion, forgiveness and patience. And I'm like, I see how we can have all of those growth in our church, but are they really required at church? What do you think? Yeah. Okay. I think that's an interesting question. And the way that I looked at it is two things I, that I feel like he's saying. One is there's a need to go to church on Sunday. But the second part is we need the organization of the church. And so the things that you just mentioned, like the the growth, the service opportunities, um, all those things come from the organization part of the church. Because without that, we don't have the motivation or the structure. And so the church provides those things. And it's like, if you think about, yes, we can can learn compassion. We can um, have personal growth. Like you mentioned, we can have all those things. 
but the church is a lab, maybe, that pushes us all together, and you have to work with these people who you might not like even. You might not enjoy their company. You might have you know, a leader, a Relief Society president or a bishop who just rubs you the wrong way, and yet you are asked to follow them. And so I feel like it's an extra learning opportunity. Yes, it happens in church on Sunday, but it happens even beyond that through the structure of our wards, through the structure of our stakes, and then beyond that through the structure of the church as a whole. He mentions um, you know, going out and serving missions or the help with refugees or humanitarian and those kind of things that would not be possible if we were just at home trying to do our best. It's a way for us to band together. I love your answer. (laughs) Yes, I love that answer so much. And so Chanel is going to teach this on Sunday in her Relief Society, right? Yes. I I wonder if anybody's going to ask a question like that, because I, I don't think that that is a crazy question to ask. No. I think there were some things here that was like, well, Yeah, I understand that we get that at church, but yeah. So Elder Oak says, Members who forego church attendance and rely only on individual spirituality separate themselves from these gospel essentials. And then he lists them. The power and blessings of the priesthood, the fullness of the restored doctrine, and the motivations and opportunities to apply that doctrine. Yeah, that's so good. And I think we all constantly need that reminder. You know, we need to see that and like, oh, yeah, it matters how active I am in the church. And a luckily, right? It's a blessing for us. Activity, yes, means going to church on Sunday, but there's so many other opportunities to be an active part of the church. Um all the opportunities that we have for service and all the opportunities that we have to um, just minister and reach out and do all those things, that matters because that's how we receive the things you just said, power and blessings of the priesthood, the fullness of the restored doctrine, and the motivations and opportunities to apply that doctrine. It's not all just like, oh, this would be good. This would be a good program if we did this. No, it's an opportunity to live those things and to apply that doctrine. Yeah. And, and in our church, we ask that people are members, like active members of the church, because our temple recommends are reliant on that activity. Mm. They ask us in our temple interviews, if we attend church regularly, they ask us if we pay tithing regularly, they ask us those things because it is important. And I think that our temple recommend especially for males, is also a corresponding parallel whether or not they're worthy of using the priesthood that they hold. Mm, That's so good. I like that insight. I think also you bring up another good point about just temples in general, that that's another reason why we need the church. Yes, what we do at church on Sunday prepares us to go to the temple, but in a broader sense, we wouldn't even have temples if we didn't have the church structure and the church organization. You know, we need members paying their tithing to be able to build the temple in the first place. It all kind of works together. The word that's coming to mind is synergy, right? There's all these pieces that come together. And then Sabbath worship prepares us to go to the temple. Yeah. And like you mentioned so beautifully earlier, it it kind of rubs off our, um, our rough spots when we're listening to someone and being annoyed, and yet we have to rein it in and we have to change ourselves. We are sanctifying. And that was a word he used in here somewhere. Um, I don't know if I highlighted it, but he talked about how going to church sanctifies us. And I wondered, how does it do that, really? But I think that you have helped me to find an answer with that. It sanctifies us. It purifies us if we let it, if we are constantly checking ourselves and being led to be better. And so that's one way it it does that. Like you were just saying, the organization of the church allows us to serve so easy. Like I I know people who are always looking for opportunities to serve with their family. I'm not one of those people. (laughs) I applaud them, but I am so grateful for any opportunity the church comes forward with and says, Hey, we're going to do this together. Would you like to participate? I'm like, Oh yeah, I can totally do that. 
But when I'm out looking for something by myself, I'm like, I don't know, I don't know how to do that. So I, I love that about the church. Like it makes it so easy to serve others. I love that. I agree. It's the best. I mean, <laughs> the kids might not love it, but it's so good for them. I have a recent experience. We went, it's our wards month to clean the building. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went with our whole family, which we don't always do, but we had our four boys and our nephew was spending the night. And my boys are big boys. They're tall. Um, and my nephew's even taller. He's like six foot seven. My son is six foot six. There's just these big boys. And we were the only ones who came that day. But when we walked in, the man um, – who is, you know, that's his calling. And he was there. He was so excited to just see this army of big strapping young men ready to clean the building. And I, I was just so glad and they felt good because they knew that he really needed them. And it's a good feeling. And yeah, the church gives us opportunities to do that. In fact, I was talking to um, a family member recently who said, some of his kids are not um, really active in the church right now. And he said that he wished, looking back, he wished he had given them more opportunities to serve so that they would really get what the church was about. Huh. Um, I think he did a good job and, and gave them lots of opportunities. But just looking back at his older children, that's the things that he wishes he would, would have done differently. That's interesting. I guess that goes way back to one of the talks about no one can worship for you. You must do your own waiting upon the Lord. I think waiting upon the Lord is service. And since we don't see our Savior right in front of us, we serve others. And that is our waiting upon the Lord. We serve others. That's interesting. I like the way you put that. And Elder Oak says, most humanitarian and charitable efforts need to be accomplished by pooling and managing individual resources on a large scale. That's thank you for having the church for that opportunity, right? Yeah, exactly. Another example of that is um, there are some refugees in our area. And I've seen just how many people have to come together to help one family. And so, you know, it's someone to find the apartment and someone to ask people for furniture and someone to collect furniture. And there's just so many pieces. And then uh, food needs to be picked up and food needs to be delivered. And there's so many pieces. Each one little piece is not all that important. And each person who doing the service, right, their job is not all that important. And sometimes so then it feels like, oh, I just did this. And yet the organization of the church, the church as a whole, putting that all together is what allows, in this specific example, these refugees to have what they need and to start their new life here. And I think we can take that example and you know see that in so many other instances throughout our service. We just do this tiny piece, but because of what the church has in place, it changes lives and it just ripples out and makes a huge difference. Yeah. I love that so much. Elder Oaks goes on. He talks about joy through the companionship of the Spirit. And that's a blessing we receive by being worthy, which temple and church attendance helps us keep our mind focused on being worthy. Uh, he talks about authoritative priesthood ordinances, and we've talked about that, about temple worship. And those only come because we can say in our temple interview that we are going to church. So, one of the most basic laws is to worship in church each Sabbath day. That's one of the laws that is predicated for having all of the blessings that we have. Yeah. I mean, I think he ties it in so well that talking at the beginning, we're drifting away from going to church. The world needs more people who care about going to church. And then the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has blessings for you when you go to church. And then this part that you just brought up. It's a law of God to worship on Sunday. This is a commandment. It matters yeah. be a part of the church. Yeah. And he mentions that at the very beginning that uh, when Christ was on the earth, he created a church for people to go to after he was gone. I'm like, yeah, that's a pretty good indicator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was kind of the point. So yeah. <laughs> yes. So good. Well, I think we have covered um, all the things that really stood out to me and that spoke to me in this talk. Was there anything else you wanted to make sure and touch on? 
No, I think we've got it all for me too. Okay, awesome. Well, I think that there were so many good things in this talk that were just reminders for us to do a little better, to make our worship more meaningful for us. And I think that, you know, there's always room for improvement, no matter how, how, even if we're going every Sunday, what we do on Sunday can change. And even if we, you know, are signing every sign up sheet that goes around, there's still always changes. And it comes down to often not even the things that we do. Sometimes the things that we do might not need to change. It might need to be the way that we do them. And the attitude and the, you know, the way that we feel about what we're doing. I think this is a really good summary right here. He says, despite the good works that can be accomplished without a church, the fullness of the doctrine and its saving and exalting ordinances are available only in the restored church. So thank God that we have the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Oh, I love it. The perfect place to end. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you, everyone, for listening to another episode of the Conference Talk Podcast. If you like this episode, give us a five-star rating on iTunes or your favorite podcast app and share us with a friend. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to read the talk we've discussed, find the resources we've mentioned in the show notes and send us a message or follow us on social media. You can do all of that on our website, conferencetalk.org. Big thanks to Andrea for hopping on the mics with me. And Andrea, let people know where they can find you. I actually have a podcast called Tribe of Testimonies, all one word. And you can find me on Facebook, on Instagram, or at uh, tribeoftestimonies.buzzsprout.com. Awesome. And you can find me at Chanel Nielsen Coaching on Facebook or Instagram. Thanks for joining us. And we'll catch you next week with another episode of the Conference Talk Podcast. Bye.